You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 53. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm Katie Wardrobe, a music technology education trainer, speaker and consultant from midnightmusic.com.au where I help music teachers use technology effectively in music education. In this episode, I talk with Sean Alongo from New Jersey. I saw Sean present at the Texas Music Educators Convention back in February and I really loved her enthusiasm and I loved hearing about the innovative ways she's using technology in her teaching. I knew I really had to have her come on and share her ideas on the podcast but I also kind of guessed we'd probably have way too much to cover in a single episode. So today, Shauna and I talk about her background and some of the ways she's integrating tech into her ensemble rehearsals and performing groups. We ended up speaking for just over an hour on this topic alone, so I definitely will have Shauna back on in the future to talk about some of the other fantastic things that she's doing, which we just simply couldn't fit into today's episode. You can find the links to the things that we talk about on the show notes page for this episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 53. Shauna Longo is the music educator, STEAM facilitator and arts integration specialist at Hopatcong Borough Schools. I had to check my pronunciation on that one. She teaches general music technology classes to grade six to eight students, has established makerspaces as part of the STEAM initiative at her school. She serves on numerous committees and presents professional development workshops to other educators in her district and beyond. Shauna was awarded the New Jersey Music Education Association Master Music Teacher in February 2018 and the Governor's Teacher of the Year Award in 2016. And from the looks of her LinkedIn profile, which I did look at, I'd say she's definitely a high achiever. (laughs) In her downtimes, she likes to go outdoors like I do. And she loves to spend her summer vacation at her family's lake house in Ontario, Canada. Oh my gosh, did I say that right? I had a total mental blank. Welcome, (laughs) Shauna. Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. So great to have you. So um, is that where you grew up then, where your summer vacation is now? Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up in Pennsylvania uh, near the Poconos, and but my family would <clears throat> go on vacation in Canada to my grandparents, had a lake house there oh. every single summer. And so we've I've continued that, and now we take my son there every summer, and absolutely love it. It's just good to kind of get away. It sounds beautiful. I'm really dying to go there. I would love to just go. Um, it's one of my the next two countries that I'd like to visit, Canada, and I've been okay. to New Zealand. New Zealand is quite similar in sort of the mountains and lakes thing, and I have been there, but I haven't been to those scenic parts of it, so I'm really, really hanging to get there, which would be so nice. And I'm, I was laughing about the pronunciation of your school and area because uh, we had jokes about this in the past about Hapat Kong and how it's hard to say and you've got to put the emphasis on the other syllable to what you expect so <laughs> so hopefully I just said all right <laughs> so we met at the Texas uh, convention um, as I did with a number of other people who are sort of you know leading people in music technology and education it's such a great place to catch up with people and I actually saw one of your sessions on a, a morning I think it was a Thursday morning of the convention and then I was planning on going to Eric Whitaker's session in the afternoon and I stood him up and came back to your second session. (laughs) I can't believe that's like the biggest compliment in the world. (laughs) Yes, I opted not to do the fangirl thing. I think there were a lot of people doing fangirl, you know, with Eric Whitaker. Um, But, you know, I figured I just wanted to see what else you had to say because the the first session was so great and um, it was just practical. It's the sort of thing that I like to do in my sessions, very practical. Uh, tips and we'll get to those uh, later in this chat because I'd love you to share some of those but but it was it was really great and um, and lots of fun and did you have highlights of the TMEA convention yourself what were your favorite things that you saw walking into the exhibit hall for the first time is one of those moments that you just 
can't put to words and people can't even get a grasp of until you're there. Um, and just even, and, I mean, it's just unbelievable the amount of vendors and, and the amount of people. I mean, even just walking around San Antonio, everywhere you look and turn, there's someone with a TMEA convention badge on. Yep. And more, the, more than that, they're often holding an instrument. It's hilarious because you walk yes. down the street and there's a tuba or a sousaphone or yeah, it's, whatever. It's the norm. <laughs> It's hilarious. And um, mariachi bands, of course, are, are performing in San Antonio. The locals are performing. But then also there's the students who are at the convention performing Correct. all the mariachi dance stuff as well. And it's just amazing. And, yeah, you're right. You just walk around and it's it's just music everywhere. And the the exhibit hall, I was the same. And I think, like, I'm sort of surprised that you say that as well from being from the States because to us here in Australia, everything's very – much on a smaller scale, especially our music education mm-hmm. conferences where our biggest ones are, you know, maybe 300 people. We have one which is about 800 people, which is, you know, our largest and it's like, wow. But the exhibit hall at Texas is just insane. And I did a calculation based on our, our in Melbourne where I live, our city has a convention centre where all of the big, you know, ex- exhibitions come to and I looked up the floor space in there and it's smaller than what the Texas conference floor space was for this music education conference. And our Melbourne Convention Centre is where they do the big home shows and car shows yes. and everything, you know, and this music education bigger than that. It was just nuts. Well, well it really exemplified that saying everything's bigger in Texas so because much bigger. it just is. <laughs> it and nuts. talking about the mariachis, it's funny because I got, I took a picture of one of the student groups and did a social media post like you know you're in Texas when dot 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 (laughs) you know (laughs) oh they're just amazing and um yeah such a great sort of cultural thing I know a a mutual friend of ours Stephanie she had also taken some uh, a little bit of video footage of of some of those performing groups and they're just great I didn't get to go and see them but yeah just fabulous it's it's a whole nother thing we really don't have that here in Australia so it was nice to see something different we don't have it in New Jersey either so don't worry (laughs) (laughs) true (laughs) I think everyone needs to get to TMEA once in their life just to experience the thing. It's just crazy. So tell us about your school. What, you know, what sort of, um, what size is the school? What, what type of uh, things go on there? You know, where, where is it um, located and, and that sort of thing? So my school is grade six, seventh, and eighth, and we have about 110 to 120 students per grade level. So in my school, there's probably about 350 kids about that um, in the middle school alone. Um, we're located about, mm, about, about an hour outside of Manhattan west of Manhattan. So we're super close to the city, but yet we're right over the border where we're at the start of rural areas. Um, So you have a nice mix there and we're situated right on Lake Kopatkong, which is the biggest lake in New Jersey. Um, Lots of fishing, lots of boating and recreation surrounding the lake, which is nice. And that offers some environmental resources and teachable moments through that also as well. Um, so within my school, we, I have my own music room. Um, it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm very blessed. Um, the band director and I, we have like a, uh, adjoining rooms. So it's like a, our little like hotel suite where we can just open the room, <laughs> between, the door between the two. Um, and then we just put in and we're just putting the finishing touches on the makerspace in our school, which we call an innovation lab. Um, because we wanted to kind of elevate the the title a little bit as it's middle school and we maker can sometimes be thought of as you know the younger grades um but we can talk about that later as well the details of those um so you know it's it's a great little town it's a smaller town definitely and it has that small town feel even though we're so close to the re- resources of you know New York City um i just did a trip it's an hour west and took my kids to the Martin Guitar Factory and they got to see the guitars being handmade just this past Tuesday like 2 days ago yeah um, i saw your pictures on facebook it looked amazing the the level of detail and um craftsmanship in in the guitars amazing I've been doing this is the, my fourth time doing this field trip, and it's 
I'm never bored. Like there's more to see and more questions to ask. And they're constantly changing out the guitars in the, um, in their museum. The late, the woman told me there that worked there that they have a thousand guitars in their humidified, like, chamber room that um are swapped out into the museum these aren't even ones that are purchased these are like museum pieces and only two people have keys to access those guitars oh wow do you think i mean this is this is probably a silly question are they ever played though the ones that are sort of just exhibit exhibition pieces for the museum do you think they're ever played I, I I don't know. I mean, they had one signed by Johnny Cash in there. They have, I mean, they have the um, the backpacker that they that they made and sent, went to outer space. That's in their museum yeah. um, with NASA. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's it's yeah. real. And I've heard that about a lot of museums that the the things that you see actually in the museum exhibition space is you know yeah. like twenty percent of their total collection or ten percent. I don't know whatever the figure is, but yeah. Um, same thing with that. You here in Melbourne, we have the Art Centre, and they have you know a whole heap of stuff just in right. storage until the next time they bring out the exhibition. So it's crazy. It is, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. And your role at the school, I know I mentioned in the intro you, you're teaching general music and STEAM uh, is on your thing as well and um, arts integration. And I know you've done a lot of choral directing in the past as well and I believe maybe a touch of drama too. So, you know, is there anything you're not doing or is it just <laughs> everything <laughs> Yeah, so I, I actually started my career out as a band and orchestra director, um, competitive marching band and jazz band, high school. And then things kind of transitioned and I, I did some um, elementary general music and choral, um, which then led me to high school choral um, and then administration. I left the classroom and went into admin for a little bit and I was a supervisor of a K-12 to music program. Um, and then I for a number of reasons, decided to go back into the classroom. Um, and that was eight years ago. And um, so I, where I am now in that school, and I started a, a choir program, I picked that up and expanded it immensely, and then started a drama program. Um, and just this year, I stepped back from the the choir and the drama directing those. It was so time consuming and they were both after school. The choir does not exist during the school day in my school. Um, and I wanted, my son was going to kindergarten and I wanted to be able to get him off the bus and spend that time with him. So, um, that was a personal choice I made. Um, but then things got busier with my steam and arts integration. So I feel like it, things just kind of shifted. <laughs> you but filled up that, the time. <laughs> I flipped the time, but, but with that, I can do it like now when he's in bed or, or, you know, things like that, that, um, you know, I have a little more flexibility versus at, you know, a certain time every day for those. Um, so yeah, so during the day I'm teaching, um, general music, music technology, but then I also have flex time to within the school day, collaborate with other teachers in developing and co-teaching arts integrated and steam lessons. Oh, so that's depending so good. on what their lens is. And do you go into their classrooms for that or is it part of your own classes? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it, yes, is it you going both. into them? It's both. Okay. Oh, so. Cool. I'll do it in my class, um, mainly because it doesn't, I don't necessarily have the same kids as any other teacher. In fact, I don't, I don't have the same, like my eight, my period one, eighth grade class, no one else has that exact mix of kids throughout the day. Mm. So to do true collaboration just doesn't work. So you have to find what works for you in terms of that. Um, so my I, I do it myself in my classroom and I'll consult and I might bring in a math teacher to my room. Um, but then I also push myself into their room um, and co-teach and guide them and coach them on arts integration and STEAM lessons, pulling music, visual arts, dance, theater into those non-arts content rooms. I think that's such a great way. It's kind of very forward thinking of the school to be um, so supportive of that. And so who was the driver of that initial uh, idea in the first place? Was it principal of the school or, or you or someone else? So it started um, four years ago with our superintendent. She came in and, and she's no longer with us, but she saw that the students, when the Common Core came through and the push for park testing focus, um, 
a lot of the teachers became very focused on just teaching the exact standards and preparing for tests, and they lost sight of the student engagement. So when she heard about arts integration, she thought that that would be a great way to bring, you know, heighten that engagement for the kids back in the classrooms. Um, And as soon as I heard arts integration, I'm like, advocacy, advocacy, man, I'm going to jump on board with this because this could be my greatest tool to really elevate my program. I actually want to talk a little bit more about the advocacy um, side of what you do. I'd like to talk about that in more detail later on because um, that was something I really noticed as a theme in both of your sessions that I saw. So, yeah, I'll come back to that then. We'll talk about that. Yeah, I I think it's a great thing. I think um, the way that you're very targeted, not targeted, what's the right word? Um, you're conscious and mindful of it at all times, I think, I'm guessing. And I think that's a, a great thing, but we will do, talk more detail. So we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. <laughs> so, so she initially brought it um, and then she had the admin kind of start to get on board, the, the other administrators, the principals. Um, and then I really just jumped on and just embraced it and just started studying it and researching it and, and crafting and honing my practice and how will I coach with teachers. And, and I used some of the skills I had learned as an administrator previously, um, you know, to help guide me with that. Um, it's definitely been a journey over the past four years, but it's been an awesome journey for sure. Oh, good. Um, and then, you know, my principal saw the great work and the collaboration and the change in the school culture through this teachers working together and delivering content and, and approaching content in different ways to get the kids excited to learn that he bought it. And that's how I have now the flexibility. And I'm even working with um, K to 12. So I'm not only just in my school for the arts integration team, I'm in all of the schools kind of working area. with teachers. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I have so many questions. <laughs> and <laughs> I mentioned before we hit record, we were talking about the fact that I already know we need to have a second podcast uh, session together because <laughs> um, it's not possible for us to cover everything I really want to talk about today. So <laughs> today we've decided we'll talk about the technology tips for, you know, sort of band, orchestra, yep. choral directors. But, you know, I really want to come back to much more information and detail about the STEAM and the maker spaces and all all that stuff too. So we will save that for another episode. <laughs> but what Sounds about good. what about technology? Um, what sort of what's the attitude towards technology at the school? I'm guessing it's probably good. Obviously, it sounds like um, that's a, a just a natural part of what you do there. But what what do the kids use mostly, or what do you have access to there? Okay, so when I got to this school eight years ago, um, they had some computer labs. Um, but in the music room, the general music room, there literally wasn't even a pencil in the teacher's desk. There was nothing there, no curriculum. I mean, there was a curriculum, but it was like, you know, the standards and that was it. Um, (laughs) which you had that moment of like, oh my God, I have nothing. Um, and then you have the moment of, oh, I have nothing. Yeah. So I I would get excited. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I got excited and the principal took me on a tour. And the last room he showed me was a brand new Mac lab. And I literally had that "Ah," moment. (laughs) Um, And he's like, do you think you'd want to use it? And I was like, absolutely. So we went down and looked at the schedule, which I said, well, let's determine when it's available. So I know which grade level to kind of plan for. Um, And side note, I had been to one session. I didn't own a Mac myself. At that point in time, I'm now all Apple, everything. Um, I had been to one PD workshop, 45 half or an hour long workshop on like Garage Band 101 <laughs> with Marge Lepresti, um, like like l- two or three weeks before this happened. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was going to do it. Like I was not giving up that opportunity. Um, So I just figured it out. And now we are one-to-one Chromebook school. Um, We still have three computer labs. Um, And then my classroom has 20 iMac computers, 13 iPads. Um, I've got uh, two Jam Hubs. I've got, you know, some microphones did it various microphones and things like that. Um, and that's, I've got some makey makey kits. Um, well, you're you know, really so, well set up now. That's awesome. <laughs> so now I'm, but it's taken me eight years 
Um, you know, I've got a big, and I was juggling between classrooms and I was like, I wasn't on a cart, but I, I was carrying a bag constantly because I was in the lab, back in my room, in this room, and just kind of using whatever resources to get as much tech going as I could yeah. until I took over this bigger space that let me do everything in one place. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's such a, a key tip for other people out there is um, from two points of view, if you don't have physical resources yet or only have a few, mm -hmm. you kind of just need to use what you've got and make use of that yeah. and use them to their full advantage. And then hopefully you build up over time. And um, when we get to the advocacy part, I reckon that's a good, a good tactic is yeah. to, you know, build up the advocacy for your program so that people can see that you need and are using these awesome well, resources and can grow from there. Yeah. And I also think that when – when you show your administration and when you get the kids excited about what you are doing with the tech, when you make a plan, a true plan for how you're going to, how you want it to evolve, like a five year strategic plan for it, because that's kind of what I did, then that you show them you're serious. Like you've done your research. This is what I want to do. This is going to be the results. This is what, how it will impact the students, the school. Here's the funds I need. We can roll it out over this many years. Here would be my plan to do that. It shows them that you've got, you've done, you've put your time in and they're not just wasting money on yes. stuff that's going to collect us. Closet. It's brilliant because that's talking their language. And I'm guessing that your experience as a, an administrator has yeah. helped you with that because this is what I do. I look at it from the other side. You, you kind of go, what is mm -hmm. what is the information the other person needs or why would they give you? And it comes down to things like pay right. raises. If you're in a corporate job, you know, why should someone get a pay rise? Well, you need to go back and have all this evidence and, and you know, keep track of things mm -hmm. and have a plan. Having a plan is so brilliant. Like I, I think... Yeah. I'd be so curious to know how many teachers do that because I, I suspect it's like almost no one. <laughs> and uh, I do a number of events uh, presenting here with um, with a, a, a guy in South Australia, Keith Huxtable, who has Music Ednet, and he and his team run a music technology education focused uh, retail company and they, they provide people with help and products and stuff. But this is <laughs> their approach as well is to take the approach of, what is the five-year plan? What's the 20-year plan or anything in between? Or yep. this is where you want yep. to get to. You need $80,000 to do what you want to do, but it's not going to all be next year. But over time, yep. you know, in three years' time, yes, that's what you might achieve, but you have to show the administration how to get there and why you need it and, and all of those things. So good for you. Absolutely. So good. <laughs> so good. Thank and I was going to say you. before as well, you know, starting out small with resources is, is one thing as well. And I think also as a teacher – Starting out small is not a bad thing from your own skills point of view because you just kind of use what you've got and you learn as you then grow with the the resources as well. And Absolutely. suddenly, like if you look at your collection of stuff, you've got Chromebooks and Macs and iPads and whatever else the makey makey kits. And it's not yeah. like you would have just had all of those one day and gone, oh my gosh, what do I do with all this stuff? You, you grew over time and add in and add in and add in. And I think that's such a great way to go well, too. Otherwise you're absolutely overwhelmed if you have too much. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's super overwhelming. And I also think that um, my kids taught me a lot because they would figure things out and you can't forget to rely on them because yes. they're a great resource. They're such a great resource. Um, I love it. Yes. They're such a great resource and, and you got to give them the props. And, and I always told my kids, listen, I don't know everything. So if you figure something out, share it. I yeah. can't wait to learn. I love to learn. Yep. And that goes a long way with the kids. Yep. And we just mentioned in a, I mentioned in a previous episode, I think just recently, no idea which one it was, but we were talking about that. And basically that's the attitude I have. You don't need to know everything yourself. And in fact, people are more on side if you announce up front, look, I know a fair bit about this, but I don't know everything. And how about we learn together or, you know, let's help each other out. And, oh, the, the excitement that kids have when they get to teach you or the rest of the group, you know, they're kind of like really proud and, you know, yeah. yes, I know. This Absolutely. Thing. That's awesome. Yeah. That, and that's exactly what I did with my um, chiptune uh, unit with teaching, with coding and composition. Yes was the kids, I told the kids, I'm like, okay, I've previewed this, I've tried it out, but we're going to like really learn this together. 
they love it. Yeah. They get they so excited. They do. They really do love it. Yeah. Now, I know I, I did notice because I, you know, cyber stalk you because you have to do that when you're researching someone <laughs> on your LinkedIn profile that you've you've done the certification uh, courses um, like the Google Level 1 and Level 2 Google mm-hmm. Classroom and then the Apple what do they call theirs? Apple Certified Teacher, something like yeah. that. And I think you've done a STEAM yeah. one as well. So what what was your motive? I think they're a great idea because I feel like I feel like people, from a learning point of view, people want to kind of tick a box, you know, and, and if you can say, hey, I'm certified with this, I think it's such a great thing. It's something I'm considering including in my own um, online community. Like I'll have a basic music tech certification you know thing or, or something like that because I think people love that yeah so what what got you started doing those things and and how has that been and good results well, I'm guessing yeah well you know I I was doing um I had a little bit of time amazingly last year <laughs> what um, yeah what is that um that doesn't exist this year um <laughs> And so I was like, you know, I'm using all the Apple. I am Apple everything. I've got these onyx. I've got these iPads. What is this? And an email came through and I'm like, what is this certification program? And I'm like, oh, and so um, that's where it started. And I was like, oh, I could do that. I'll do this. Why not? Um, And then we are a Google school. So we, you know, have Google everything. And um, my administration was encouraging teachers to do the Google certification program. So I kind of jumped right one of the first ones, like, I'll do it, um, did that. And then this year they came to me and said, hey, we're going to offer a boot camp for the level two. Are you interested in going level two? I'll yep. do that. Yep. Um, and actually, I just got an email today about potentially doing the um, Google Innovator. I saw that actually. I was looking into it for myself because I, I just want to do it so that I have a really good understanding when people ask me questions about Google Classroom integration, right. I can answer the questions well. And um, I need to contact them because the Google account that I've got is a business one and it won't let me sign up for the course or Classroom oh, generally. No, so right. I'm like, I need to contact them and say, you must have some sort of professional development provider option here, you know. But right, right. yeah, that sounds really good. And I did see that they've got this innovator thing, which is kind of like a next level, like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like it's a showing the innovative ways that you're using Classroom and sort of, yeah, basically sharing those ideas with other people. Is that right? Yeah. And you, and you go there with like a problem and you try to find a solution for it, like a current problem within your school that you could be innovative in finding a solution oh, to oh, that's do it. Cool. So, um, it's not going to happen this year because I'm also, because I am currently doing the education closet arts integration and steam yes. certificate, a specialist certification program. Um, so I just don't have the time right now, but you know, what led me to that was when this arts integration movement came in initiative came into my school and I immediately jumped on board. Um, you know, I started the research and ed closet is really the place to go, um, for everything, arts integration and yep. steam I yeah, love that really stuff. Is. She does a great job. It's Susan Riley. She's amazing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yes. really great. Yeah. So when Susan, you know, I got an email about the potential certification, um, you know, I looked at what it was, what it meant, and I'm like, I'm loving what I'm doing with the arts integration. So it just made sense for me. I mean, I love to learn. Um, so it was kind of that next step for me. Yeah. I think it's so great. I think it's um, it just gives you that extra level of um, not only do you get to tick a box off, but I find I learn things that you just wouldn't have even known just going along your own way because you tend to use software or services or whatever in your own special way. And then sometimes someone right. will say something to you and you go, oh, my gosh, I never considered doing that or using it in that way. And, and that's why conferences are so great too because you see people doing oh, these absolutely. awesome things. <laughs> yeah. And that's what really led me to a lot of my Chromebooks workshop that I presented at TMEA because – Um, a lot of the ideas came through doing those and they get you outside of your traditional music education bubble that you can be stuck in. And, and I I think it's, you know, it's important to connect with those other initiatives in the school to, 
to make yourself more relevant. Yes, that's a great segue into tips and that sort of thing. Um, we, that was why I contacted you in the first place about being on the podcast because, you know, we were talking about, um, well, I'd seen your presentation, which was, um, tell me the title of it again, Chromebook something something, um, oh my, it was like the the reference yeah. to um, thing I what's the movie? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's Chromebooks, the cloud and concerts. Oh my. That's what. <laughs> yeah. And really it didn't have to be Chromebooks, um, you know, to, yeah. to do a lot of the things or any of the things because uh, Chromebooks, for, for those listening that may not be familiar with Chromebooks, because I know there are people out there who just have never seen a Chromebook and don't know why it's a thing or why it's different. Basically, it's a it's a lightweight laptop, very inexpensive, and it really just surfs the net. And so you can't install mm-hmm. software. So everything you do on a Chromebook has to be online, online based, and um, yeah, use the Chrome browser. You visit a place and use the software there. So for music production type things, Soundtrap is used by a lot of people, or Soundation, mm-hmm. and Google Classroom is usually big with Chromebooks users because it's the whole thing. <laughs> it's like right. such a great infrastructure to use so and so it was really good your session because although it said Chromebooks in the title everything that happened in there could be done on any device essentially and it was a session focused for band orchestra choir teachers um, ensemble leaders essentially and and using tech uh, in in ways that maybe they hadn't thought of before so I'd love you to run us through a few of those the things that you talked about okay. there. yeah so um the First thing I kind of talked about was utilizing Skype um, to in the classroom, in rehearsal setting. And there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, but I think that one of the most effective ways is using Skype to bring in a composer into, or an arranger right into your classroom. And, you know, you could even think about bringing in a tech expert or um, I was presenting this workshop at the New Jersey conference, New Jersey Music Educators Conference. And one of my good friends raised his hand and said, hey, um, I actually did this and I did it with another school. Yes. So he found another school that was performing the same piece they were. So oh. they Skyped their classes together in a rehearsal to play for each other and get feedback, um, so which cool. is just a great idea. Yeah, so cool. So cool. And that, um, that's the funny thing, actually, when I saw you talk about that, like I was, you know, you were saying Skype a composer in or, um, you know, and, and you can obviously do that with living composers, which is awesome. Obviously, it's not going to work for every composer, right. you know, Beethoven right. or something, maybe not so much, but um, living composers are even better or even arrangers of, of works. Um, but then you mentioned right. about, because I was picturing just the composer speaking and the kids being able to see them on the screen, which is what you meant. But then, of course, you talked about the fact that they're in the rehearsal band room or whatever they can play for the composer if you get the audio hooked up two ways they're going to play and I was like of course why would I why did I not think of that yeah so so to have like a virtual rehearsal with the composer where they can listen and really you know we can tell our kids you know things to correct or ways to make it better and it goes in one ear and out the other but they hear it from somebody else and all of a sudden like (laughs) it, it they connect um so it's a really great means for doing that and and I encourage people to, um, you know, I'm going to spin back, you know, me on the advocacy, but you know, when you're doing things like this to bring your principal, invite them, um, you know, invite the superintendent in press release it afterwards so that people know what you're doing because it's different. It's innovative. You're bringing in that technology. You're connecting these kids directly to another level of the music that they're studying. And I think that that's oh so important. Um, and another idea with the Skype is, um, if you try it out, you know, in a rehearsal setting, even to Skype in the composer to introduce your piece, their piece, actually, in a concert. Yes, you know? yes. And now in the you're doing it in front of the whole audience. You've got all the parents there. I mean, that's like an off the charts advocacy moment right there. Yes, yeah, so good. And I know that when you do it with the students just in their rehearsal setting, I know that you're not just like, hey, at two o'clock on Wednesday, we've got this composer popping in for a little bit. I know that you actually have a process where you kind of work out ahead of time what it is you want to get out of this and you know, what the kids are going to do afterwards as well. Like there needs to be some sort of follow-up and response. So tell us about that that process. Okay. So beforehand, um, definitely have your goal determined. Is it going to be meet the composer? Is it going to be a virtual rehearsal? 
what is going to be your purpose for it. Um, and then talk to the kids about, um, you know, discuss the process components for composing, drawing connects, connections to the writing process that they're using in English language arts. Because now you're starting to make cross-curricular connections that they will um, be able to connect those dots. And I always like to have the kids formulate questions ahead of time. And I would use Google Forms and have the kids come up with questions for the composer based on their music. So now they're also citing textual evidence from the piece. And you can use this as a formative or summative assessment, depending on how you want to do it, because you're pulling that information and making sure the kids can use the correct musical vocabulary and talk about the pieces and, and really ask good questions. Nice. Um, and then I like to have them typed up and select, you know, pre-select the ones and have them typed for the kids on their music stand because you don't want them to get nervous and forget what they're supposed to say. Um, so that's an important little step there. Um, but then, and then during it, during the session, you know, having the full ensemble participate, performing sections, receiving, receiving feedback from the composer, asking questions, um, all during it. And then afterwards using Google forms again for the kids to reflect and you can craft the questions and it can just be a simple two questions that they have to answer. One, what did you learn during the Skype session today? Two, what will you take to, um, your next practice session? So how is this going to change how you practice? So you're making them think how it's going to directly impact and benefit them as a performer. Yes, excellent. So good. I think I think things are so much more effective when you do that planning beforehand of, of what it's going to look like during the session and, and all of those preparation things and follow-up things. Um, you just get so much more out of something like this at that time. And have you had – what's what has the student reaction been like when you've done this? And, and has there been any surprising outcomes that you weren't expecting? Um, no, the kids, they love it. I mean, it's so exciting. I mean, listen – First thing I will say is make sure sh- make sure to set up a, a dry run with the composer or arranger to just do a tech chess yep. tech <laughs> check um, because as we were talking about before we started there's you know you're gonna have tech glitches I don't care who you are and how great you are <laughs> something will go wrong it will um, totally. I am not too proud to say I absolutely once I know how to set things up. I know what I'm doing, but I will still take pictures of exactly what chords are where and where it's located. Yes, I do too. But even still. Yeah, I do too. And I write it down. I, I've had this thing lately. Yep. I'm really on a, 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 a like a mission to write down all my processes and I'll put photos into the document and it's just a Google Doc which and it can be the most yeah. simple thing but if you don't if you do the Skype call one day and then you might not do it for another three months and then you come back to it mm-hmm. and you're like oh my gosh which, which was that chord that I used or exactly or you go through the same problem solving as you did the previous time and that annoys me like anything I don't want to problem solve oh, yeah. the same thing I know I problem solved earlier so <laughs> write it down right. Put five, yep. two photos, yeah. Write perfect. it down, take pictures, document it yep. so that you, you know, can remember. Um, and it, it, you know, have have a backup plan, two, three, or four. Yes. <laughs> Another favourite of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Contingencies all over the place. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. Tell us about the tech needed. So are you running the Skype with the composer on it from your, is it an Apple, um, like a MacBook Pro or is it just a a Chromebook? Are you running it from that and that's attached to a data projector so the kids can see the composer? Yes. Yep. 
Correct. Yeah. Yep. So I've got a webcam hooked up or the camera on a some kind of camera. I mean, I, it depends what I'm doing. I might even just put an iPad up on a stand um, on an on a iPad, like a video stand yeah. that holds one um, that will capture the picture for the Skype for the composer. And then I've got the composer coming up on the, the smart board or the projector screen. Um, but it's important to make sure you set up a, a microphone and I suggest like a USB, like a, um, a blue snowball or something in the center of the room. So they get a good surround yeah. sound yep. cause you don't, if you set the, if you set your mic back by your drummer, all he's going to hear is the drummer. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. you got to think about those little details. <laughs> They'll be commenting. Yeah. The percussion's a little heavy in this section. Yeah. yeah every, oh, that's because the mic's next to them. <laughs> <laughs> and right. um, when the kids read out their questions, are they coming to that microphone that you've got set up and they read it right now or it, it just is picking up enough in, in the ambiance? It just picks up enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's really good. So it's really not that complex. And I think this is what I like to, um, you know, sort of emphasize for people out there. You kind of say, let's Skype a composer in and have them on the big screen and stuff. And it sounds like it needs a lot of heavy setting up and a lot of tech stuff, but really it's the same as, Skyping like Shauna and I are on Skype at the moment and we can see right. each other and it's really the same you're just changing one thing by plugging your laptop into the data projector so the person's on the big screen that's and it. that's it and you make sure the camera's at the kids so they can see the kids or whoever it needs to be um, yep. so yeah nice and simple and really good I love I love this idea I think it's a great thing and it's such a simple way to get into using technology for an effective purpose Really, it's just a Skype call and it's not, you know, people say, how do I integrate technology or where shall I start? And I think they picture having to learn about a lot of equipment and a lot of software and they need to learn all the software program inside out before they get to, you know, before the kids and and you could just use Skype. That's cool. <laughs> you know, to start here. Yeah, that's it. Start there. Yeah. Start simple. And the Google Forms thing also I think is great because um, it's just – Google Forms is really underrated by a lot of people, I think. I use Google Forms all the time and it's such a great way to capture information. You literally just set up fields. It's very easy to, if you've never used Google Forms and set up your own sort of questionnaire or form before, super easy. Mm -hmm. It's You just look at the screen. It kind of tells you what to do. You add your questions. You say what type of question, whether it's a, you know, they type in text into a box or whether it's multi-choice or whatever. Right. And the beauty of it is when they submit their answers, it goes into this central spreadsheet. And so you as a teacher can see all of the results in one place, one spreadsheet, look down the column and see the answer to every question, you know, that question, the same through all the different kids. And I love it. It's it's super simple and great to use. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely great. And I also like it because you don't have to – I there's no more – I lost it. I can't yeah. find it. Yeah, I like that too. I turned it in. I put it in your mailbox. You didn't get it. Yeah. It's time stamped. Like yeah, it's no. time stamped. It's digitally. The excuses are gone. gone There's nothing. Totally Print. Gone. There's, yep. You know, like, and it's easier for the teacher because you can go in and check who's turned it in. Or if you have five minutes, check off a couple of them, give them the credit Versus like carting around papers, stacks of papers with you all the time that you have to go through, which just much, much more effective. Yeah. And it's also great um, in terms of teacher evaluation, because nowadays we have to document why we're doing and how we're doing and how the kids are doing. So having those neat spreadsheets are great data collection yeah. for teachers too. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know teachers, uh, you know, someone I know has in the past done things like uh, if you capture all the information, like get the kids to report back on what they did during a term or a semester. I mean, this is sort of information that goes, you know, for some subjects straight into their report. So when you need right. all that data, I need to know what piece they did and, you know, what instrument they played and whatever it is, it can be all mm -hmm. there in one space. If you've just had the kids fill it out for you quickly, <laughs> you know, it's all there in one place and you're not sort of going through lots of different, um, you know, sources of information to find what you need for well, report filling out. And it's funny because I remember back in the day when, you know, <laughs> I'd have kids submit things digitally and then my inbox is full yes. of each kid's submission and oh my gosh, it would be so no, it's overwhelming. Horrible. It's horrible. So you don't need this that is anymore. just fantastic for that. 
yeah. you can embed videos and audio right into Google Forms too. So yeah. it's that's also a great little feature. Yes. And so tell us, and, and I wanted to move on anyway to Google Classroom and the way you're using that because I know you covered that in your presentation too. So obviously gathering yeah. information about stuff, responses to things. I know that you talked about um, things like practice journals and mm-hmm. um, did you talk about listening feed, like listening journals as well, listening feedback, um, yeah. Yeah, analysis yep. and stuff. Yeah. So Google Forms there again. Yeah, Google Forms there again. I mean, practice journals, you know, we all know that the kids go home and they say they practice so much time a week and and the parents will sign off on it. But what are they really? Well, first, are they really even practicing that much? (laughs) But two, how are they practicing? So I like to use Google Forms by, um, you know, and and people say, well, tell me how to set up my practice journal. And I'm like, well, it kind of what do you want? Like what what do you want? It really requires the teacher to really think about what do they want the kids to get out of their practice? Um, and I think once you kind of shift that mindset versus you just need to do this many minutes and make it more um, driven by a specific purpose, like, okay, so I want them to be able to play this section or, um, you know, the goal isn't the number of minutes. The goal is to increase their technique or their skills. Um, so, I'll put in, um, you know, questions to guide them or they have to watch this video and um, I'll have a prompting question that they have to answer about, a, you know, maybe it's a, a video from YouTube of a song we're doing on the concert, you know, um, and having them, you know, watch this video and at measure 67, tell me what happens or, you know, like, so drawing them, getting them to become more active listeners um, and then you're assessing and you're gathering all that data also. Yeah. Um, so that can all be a part of a practice journal versus just filling in like a spreadsheet of how many minutes I practiced. Yeah, I think that's that's it. I mean, the minutes is, it doesn't tell you much. It's kind of like saying I ate a meal today, but that meal could have all been, you know, it could have been ice cream versus a plate of vegetables. <laughs> and, you know. Right, exactly. If it's not meaningful, it's not a good thing. So, yeah, so that's really great. Right. And do you do do they submit audio or video back to you of of elements of their practice sessions or skills performance stuff? They can do that through Google, um, but I have a subscription to Music First Classroom. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's a sort of an easier platform. It can. And this is the other thing I find with technology. Pretty much, there's about seventeen solutions to everything you want to do technology wise. Like, hey, I want right. my kids to submit video to me of their practice session. And you could totally do that just with Google Classroom, um, the tools involved Absolutely. there. But, you know, it's not designed for that. It'll work fine, but there are sometimes mm-hmm. other options which are just designed for that job better and they'll they'll make it an easier thing for you as a teacher and more streamlined. So, yeah, so what are they using there? Is it Practice First? Um, Music First uh, is the company that has a suite of products that you can use and um, and a great learning management system as well where, which ties everything together. And they have a, uh, one of their things is called Practice First uh, which is kind of like smart music. If people have used smart music before, that would be a fair a fair summation, would it? <laughs> I think. Yes. So practice first is fantastic, and it, you know the kids can play alone or with an accompaniment. Um, and they have a variety of method books available um, that are preloaded and in there. But that isn't the end of it. You can set, you can upload any PDF or XML file of your own and the kids can be playing along with it and it will show them. It gives them direct feedback about where they had troubles. And it's not just one note is wrong because we all know it's never just one note. Yeah. If one note's wrong, something after it's probably going to be wrong too. So what I love about practice first is it gives you this the section that then got thrown off till you got back on course. Yeah, all right. That's good. So that's really good stuff. Um, so that is, I use, I utilize that. And again, it's all the great thing about music first, it all lives in the cloud. So with the Chromebooks, the kids have them and they have them at home. As long as they have internet access at home, you're fine. You know, we, I definitely have students who don't have internet access at home. And I'm sure there are people listening to this that are thinking that in their heads too. Well, not all my kids have internet um, and I don't think that that should hold you back. You know, I offer lunchtime and and other times that the kids can come and kind of, you know, record them if they don't have it. There's always public libraries. They have Internet and Wi-Fi. Um, if you talk to them, the kids can go there. 
My school has a tech center that's open every day after school for like three to four hours. So the kids could go there and they would have that access. So I think that there's other people should be aware of students that may not have the access at home, but then have avenues for them and how they can still utilize it. Such a good thing. Such a good thing to point that out to people because I, I often come up with that. It's like a barrier. People instantly say, well, I can't do that because my students don't all have internet access. And, and I'm kind of of the same vein as you. If you come up with some alternative solutions for those that don't, and it's not always going to work. And I'm sure you wouldn't penalise the student that doesn't have internet access at home. They're not going to fail the, t- the subject just because right. they couldn't turn in something. You go, okay, well, we'll, we'll work it out better next time or, or whatever it is. But, but always providing those other options. And I've, I've found that... It's really changed. When I first started doing, you know, what I'm doing, I mean, we're talking nine years ago now, internet access was kind of like 50-50 in schools, like easy access to internet. It was there, but it wasn't fast or it was horrible or it wasn't in the music room, but it was in the rest of the school. That's often a thing. I don't know why that is. <laughs> and at home, you know, not everybody had it at home. Right. And it, But it's really shifting over time and uh, pretty much you can guarantee that all schools have it and it may not be fabulous, but they, it's there. And, you know, for most for most kids at home as well, it's it's there too. And even if you have these, these kinds of cloud-based things like Music First or whatever, you can still have the printed music. So you can have the kids practicing that at home and say, hey, just come in at lunch. It'll take two minutes and record yourself playing it. Press record. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So yeah, there's always a workaround. Um, I also utilize NoteFlight, which is also in the Music First Classroom where it can be a separate standalone, um, you know, where I can assign things to the kids through templates. I might have them, you know, we're working on E flat major scale, notate it in note flight i'll set up the template and they have to go in and put it and come up with your own rhythm you know you can give them parameters and then i'll select one of them and then that's the version of the scale we play that day for warm-ups um and the kids get excited oh, that's cool i like that one um i also have had them you know I'll give them specific parameters create a sight reading exercise tonight that's you know four measures or six measures in the key of B flat using half notes and quarter notes and or whatever we're, whatever the focus is, you can determine again, but let the kids create the sight reading exercises. And then just because it, when they hit turn it in, it goes back to my teacher account. I can easily log in and shoot it right up to the, to the smart board and the whole group does it together. And then they're, they, they have that pride. And then they also need to make sure it's good because it could end up on the board for everyone to see. (laughs) Yeah, pressure. A little bit of pressure kind of is a good thing sometimes. I love that idea because I think also as soon as you're creating something, rather than just consuming it all the time, like I know um, I – I've been doing it quite a bit on Scratch and Makey Makeys mm-hmm. lately and Scratch coding, you know, simple coding. And another mutual friend of ours, Amy Burns, you know, she has a great video of her uh, doing, she basically has an interactive recorder fingering chart. And, you know, she says, look, you can find these online. They're already out there where basically you click a button and, you know, it says this is going to be the note B. You click a button and it will light up what the fingering is on the recorder to show you. And you can find them online. They're ready made, whatever. But she says, isn't it so much cooler and better when she gets the kids to make their own interactive recorder fingering thing they code it in scratch there's a few steps involved but of course the information's going to sink in much more than if they just saw it online and went oh yeah that's a b whatever right. <laughs> so i love this thing of, of creating and then they actually use it too it's not like they're just creating it for the sake of it and it, it goes nowhere it's actually going right. to be it's, used. It's gone is that why do i have to do this yeah yes yes that's exactly it exactly um, so the the other thing I use is sight reading factory. So I just said how I had the kids create the sight reading, but then sometimes, you know, I want them to be, I want them to create, and maybe I'll have them doing both. You have to create one, but then you also have to complete this in sight reading factory, where it generates. You can tell it, you can customize exactly what it's going to have in it from rhythms, range, accidentals, dynamics, articulations, time signature, whatever it might be, what key you're in. Um, You want leaps, you want steps, whatever, and then the kids have to perform it. So I might use it as a full ensemble 
you know, as part of warm ups or assign it at night, flip that classroom and have the kids do it, record it. It shoots it back to me and I've got a quick formative or summative assessment, depending on how I want to kind of frame that. I was just thinking, I was laughing, you know, as you're saying that in my head laughing because I, I was thinking back to times where, you know, when I've done instrumental teaching in the past and you're like, I need a sight reading exercise for this kid and you, you need to fill in all those criteria. Like I need something which only has crotchets and quavers and I need it to be not too hard and it needs to be in this key. And, and then you're searching through paper books yes. for hours to, and then you find one uh-huh. exercise. <laughs> you or you spend all your time writing it yourself. Exactly, exactly. So much better to get someone else to do it for you. Yes, we've been there, done. Oh, I love technology for that reason. Um, There's so many things around now which are like that, which are just such great time-saving things and, yep, to take advantage of them. It's just, yeah, cut to the chase. And even if you've got to pay for that product, I'm about to do it. My next episode after this one is going to be some productivity tips. And one of my things, again, lately is really – making use of like paying 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 money where it's worth paying money to do Correct. for someone to do something for you or a service to do do that thing for you because ultimately it's your you have to equate your own time to an hourly rate this is what and this is how I think of it you know if if my hourly rate in inverted commas was x dollars and the thing that I'm spending all my time on is not earning me that money and it's I'm I'm better basically paying my hourly rate to do this thing and it's you know it's it's not a good use of time so okay. so basically paying for a service that will generate exercises like this for you it's such a better way to go um and that's when you know people say to me oh I don't want to pay for another software program but I think well you need to add up the hours that you would spend without that that thing you know what what are you going to spend doing it in the first place and then it becomes worthwhile paying it really Plus, does i think that and and most of these programs have not only for band orchestra instruments but choir i mean sight reading factory will produce that the kids can be singing right into their you know chromebooks or whatever they're utilizing and, and recording it um and i think it's also about just connecting with these kids because the kids are on technology 24 seven. I mean, you can't like look turn and kids don't have earbuds in their ears. I mean, they're just such in a connected world. And I feel like we're missing a component if we're not bringing that connection to, te- to, te- that technology into the classroom and it may get them more excited to practice and to, you know, to up that ante for that performance. Um, if you're kind of reaching through their means. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. And I think you just, yeah, you, you like you said, you take advantage of their interest in the technology and their their thing. So tell us about, let's just talk about this advocacy thing. Okay. <laughs> so, so when I watched you present, um, it, it wasn't something that you actually kind of had as a big thing, but I noticed a recurring theme through a lot of things that you're talking about. And I think a lot of people go on through their life as a music teacher and they they need to get money for things in their program or they need to justify their program so that it continues the following year. And I think not many people think about that along the way. It becomes a like a, a thing at the end of the year or whatever it is when someone goes, mm, actually, your program's in jeopardy for next year. And then suddenly you're like, oh, my gosh, whereas I, I suspect your approach is – you advocate all the time, regardless of whether you think your program's continuing or not, or whether everyone loves it or not. It's just a thing that you do. Yeah, I've really made it part of what I do, because I feel like if you wait until you have to advocate, it's probably too late. Um, And you're probably not, even if, you know, you get some of what you had back, it's still not going to be good enough. Um, And I feel like if you do the right kind of advocacy, and and it doesn't really... Once you get in the routine, it really doesn't take a lot of extra effort. Um, but just constantly keeping your administration informed, you know, keeping the parents informed, um, writing press releases. I love to write press releases just because you're getting it out there. I mean, in my district, um, my my colleague and I, we probably write the two of us alone more probably close to 60 to 70 percent of the press releases that go out for the district we're sending out about music and I really want to know more about this because I I know kind of 
I know how to write a press release. There's, a, there's actually kind of a standard um, format to them in, in a certain way. Like I know that usually the first paragraph sums up pretty much everything and then you go into more detail after that. And there's a bit of a pattern to them. And I would love you to talk us through that. And do you have a template that you work through? I, I kind of have ones I've used. And then, you know, a lot of times we're doing the same things. It just takes a little tweak. So if you start, if you write a couple you can kind of just tweak them a little bit. Yep. And, it's <laughs> and it's a whole new thing. And it don't have to be, you know, a dissertation. You know, sometimes it's short and sweet, just a paragraph or two paragraphs. And that's it. I mean, I think that sometimes less is more. And a lot of times, because they'll not only send them out to the, the you know, real, I don't want to say the real press, but, you know, the press, <laughs> yeah. they're going to also post them on social media. So you want to make sure that it's not too overwhelming that they can't pull out the information to do a tweet or, you know, a Facebook post for the district. Um, and that's when it's good to have quotes in there from someone involved in the thing, whether it's yourself or someone else. It's great to have a quote yes. on a separate line. And then that be is really good uh, sort of fodder for tweets and social media. And do yeah. you have... Do you send it to – so with press releases, obviously, it can just be something that's on your school website. That that might be one place that it goes to. But do you have specific people that you send it to who are in the real media? <laughs> so the local newspaper, for instance, and are there a few, so few of them? So my district and what I would encourage people is to find out how their district handles press releases. So um, years ago, um, like five, six years ago, it was you sent them out on your own and, and no one really did it. Well, now we have um, someone that's in charge of social media and the press. So I have to, she has a form and I literally just type in my press release to it, email it to her. She pushes it out to, you know, the local paper, the local um, website beyond the school district um, you know, and then to the social media and everything. So that's kind of it's it's her job. One of the um, guidance secretaries, I think it is um, that she she kind of sends it out to the world. Um, but then my own social media is also advocacy as well, you know, posting. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And then, you know, like our high school band program has their own Facebook page. So they may post it there, which is then going to go out to even more parents. So I think that there are a ton of avenues to do it and, and you just have to be vigilant and take pictures is really, really important. Take pictures is really good. And video is great too. I went to, at, at TME, I actually went to, oh, and I've forgotten his name now. Uh, one of the other presenters did a session on video and how he uses video. And it was mostly for advocacy purposes. It was kind of to like document what he was doing with his band. But a lot of the reason was for advocacy. So he did like, you know, the, the tour video, videoing the kids when they're arriving at 4.30 a.m. to get on the bus to go on a long trip somewhere for a competition. And the kids are all just like, really, really? <laughs> <laughs> and then he's, you know, on the bus and then when they get off the bus and, you know, there's little snippets and, and it's great. And um, he said th multiple things came out of that. One was that it's advocacy. He said he actually, I think, in initially didn't intend it to be that way, but posted on on Facebook or YouTube or both and it had all these views and he realized it was the kids loved the video so much that they were then sharing it and it became this advocacy tool for his whole program at the school and it, you know Absolutely. it's just it's such a great thing lots of the Instagram accounts that you see uh, that music teachers run as well I think they they're probably again not not starting out intending it to be an advocacy thing as such, but they're like, hey, this is my new room set up or I've just got these great new Macs in my room or iPads and here's what my kids are doing with coding today. And that is all, it's all fabulous advocacy. advocacy for you. All such a good thing. I was just going to say, for those in Australia, uh, we don't really have a district set up of schools in the same way you do in the state. So um, I'm thinking, you know, if you're at a government school, there would probably be someone who is the publicity type person at the school. And it might be one part of a, a larger role, but that would be the person you'd maybe go to and find out again, what, what is the policy? There will be someone who is in charge of posting to social media or to the school website or, or beyond to the local paper. And so you could just go and chat to that person and get a routine happening. That's the good thing. That, well, that is it. And, 
And I think that um, also like in the States, one thing to think of that um, we try to utilize is, you know, we're governed by a board of education, which is local community members that serve and, you know, oversee the schools. And, um, you know, I can go and I can present and talk to them and tell them what I'm doing, but it's even better to send the kids. So to work with the kids and, and have them craft you know, put together pictures in slideshow, um, in whatever format, you know, platform you want to use, but to have the kids talk about the experiences and talk about the things that are going on, um, just drives it home a little bit more than constantly hearing from the teachers. So I think using, I don't want to, I guess not saying using our kids, but, but giving the kids the opportunity to be public speaking, to be crafting these presentations, it's adding that layer to your program and to their education. And for those that might be wondering about, um, I'm thinking about privacy issues, you know, if you're videoing students or photographing them, obviously you need to check your school policy about all of that. And and it's more pertinent for the younger students. So if you're teaching elementary students, um, but just check, you know, check what the school policy is on that. Some schools, it's okay. The, the students and the parents have given permission for images of the, the kids to be shown. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they haven't. And I see on Instagram, for instance, videos sometimes being shared where the teacher's just taken a couple of minutes to blur out the faces of young students that, that can't be shown. And you still get a sense of what's happening. You can still see them playing and it's great and it still gives that that sort of idea of what's going on, but but they've been safe with that that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I've also taken pictures um, from the back of the room, so all you see are the back. Yes, yes. and that works out really. It's with tech that works marvelously. Because I know, I agree. Yeah, you want to you see, see the screen? screen. You're looking over their shoulder. I know. Yes. You're looking over their shoulder at the iPad and stuff. Yeah. I love that too. I've actually asked people because uh, you know I I am not working with students really. I occasionally do, but I'm mostly working with teachers. And I'm often saying to people, "Hey, if you try this thing that we did in the workshop, I'd love you to send me photos." And I'm I'm like, just the backs of heads are fine, <laughs> or just the student's hand on the iPad screen yep. or on the computer screen. That's cool, you know. <laughs> Send it through. Yeah, I love that too because it shows. Yeah, it shows what they're working on and um, and they're, that they're actually using it. So it's just great. I think it's fabulous. The advocacy thing so important, and I think everybody should sort of start to try and incorporate that, even in a small way. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's something that I even try to do with what I'm doing. And I do not get into the habit. I, I get into like a, a routine of it for a while and then I'll drop off. It's a bit like forming a new habit <laughs> for something. But, um, you know, I'm, I keep thinking I need to just like send out a little photo of behind the scenes or this is what I'm working on today or here's where I'm going. And yeah. um, people love to see that stuff. And, yeah, and again, it's great, great for your program. Yep. What else have we not talked about? I'm looking at my little list here. I think we've covered so much already, but um, – I'd love you just to talk, just to finish off with, uh, talk about your overall approach to making a plan for what you want to do, you know, with technology. Because I know that you talked about that in your session too. And I think that's such an important part. So we did talk about it with the Skype composer thing, but, um, but generally that's a good approach for anything that you're doing with technology really, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, so my, my plan that I like to do is number one, determine why, why do you want to do this? What is the purpose for doing this? And actually write it out, like start a document and, and answer these kinds of questions and, and, and write down your thought process because that's when it, that's what's going to get your administration to buy in and support what you want to do. Um, and then determine your resources. What do you already have access to and what will you need to add to your budget? Okay, so do you already have Chromebooks, iPads, microphones? Even the simplest things, just write it down so it's all right there. And then start to make the plan. So from why you want to do this and what you have, then determine what are your goals. Um, You know, are you looking for better documentation or data collection for your own, you know, teacher evaluation? Do you want to connect more with the kids? Do you want to, you know, jump on board with that one to one initiative that's already happening in your school? Um, bringing your classroom into the 21st century versus our traditional methods we were taught in college way back when, you know. <laughs> and I think it's still being taught in some colleges. <laughs> just <by> Yes. <laughs> well, what we remember it being when we were, you know, that age, you know, we yes. need to replicate that because our kids are not like we were back then. Um, so once you determine the goals, then you need to decide how am I going to accomplish those goals? How What's going to get me there? 
And then what technology will I use to integrate then? And then you need to make a timeline. Like how long is this going to take? You can't expect to do all of it all at once. It's just not going to happen. Yes. Got to start small. I mean, I started with GarageBand and then every year expanded a little bit. Um, so include in that the budget. You can't expect them to throw you, you know, $10,000 necessarily or $20,000 and give you a brand new room all in one year. So make a plan, start with pulling in small things. And then as you have success with those things and you're advocating and you're doing the press releases and people are getting excited about what you're doing in the classroom, um, then you can start to ask for more. Yes. Great approach. Yes. And then, you know, your administration is going to buy in and they're going to know that this stuff is actually being used. This is really connecting with the kids. This is helping, you know, prepare the kids even for the, you know, whatever standardized testing you might have. Yes, you're not math or language arts, but my kids are writing. My kids are um, citing textual evidence. They're using content specific vocabulary. And all of this is done through that technology that the school obviously invested in when they went to one to one. So if I can bring them into my band class, orchestra, choir, well, then I am giving them more of a return on that investment. I love what you're doing. I think you're doing such a great job. Thank you. <laughs> and I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's just good for people to. You need to look at it things from a business point of view. I think for the mm -hmm. advocacy and uh, for for getting more money when you need it, and for building your program. And so, looking at it from that very business point of view, planning it out is such a great a great approach, and much more likely to yield results. I'm sure than just kind of like I'd really love to get you know a class set of iPads. And well, and yeah, and that's a whole another podcast because talking about you know like. You really, and when you're doing technology, you need to talk to your tech department and find out what capabilities there are to even utilize them because you don't know the infrastructure in terms of wiring and where the hotspots are and things like that. Yes. And you want, you don't and want, that's such a good point. You don't want to get all this stuff. And then the tech department goes, oh, well, we can't even hook that up. Yeah, I get a lot of teachers emailing me saying, my IT person has told me this and it, it can't be done. And what do you think? And I'm like, well, yeah, they're probably right. And you need to kind of work with them. And it's better to do that almost before you purchase all the stuff yes. or put in for it. Um, people often say to me, you know, should I get a Mac or a PC for my next laptop? And I'm like, okay, well... Look, I, just because I use Macs and I have all Apple, same as you, all Apple everything, yes. it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right choice for you because it depends, is your school supportive of Macs? And if they are, great, then that's possibly a best option for you. But yeah. if they're not supportive and you're not a tech person yourself, not very tech savvy, you're going to be doing troubleshooting on your own. So if you're prepared for that, cool. You know, But if you're not, go with the PC if that's what's more supported at your school. So definitely talk to the IT people, keep them happy, buy them cookies and you know chocolate. <laughs> yes. That's, you've got to make friends Coffee. with those people yes. in your school. Coffee, yeah, something stronger if they like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Little exchange in the parking lot. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for chatting today. We are definitely going to do a follow up. Look, I knew we would talk a lot about this. Look, we've been going for ages. It's one topic only, and we still haven't covered, um, you know, the STEAM integration stuff and the cross curricular things. I'd love to have you back and talk about those at some point in the future. That'd be great. And, um, I was just going to say also for for people who are members of the Midnight Music community, Sean has been very kind to actually record herself doing um, the presentation that she did at TMEA. So it's going to become training inside the community and you can get a professional development certificate for that once you've done it. So um, so current members can just look out for that. By the time this podcast is published, it will probably be in there. And if it's not, it's a few days away. Um, so yes, that would be great. And yes, we'll look forward to having you on again. So thanks so much, Shauna. Thank you so much. That's it for today's show. If you'd like more help using technology, I'd love you to come and join me inside the Midnight Music community. It's an online space for music teachers to learn more about technology through online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, tips and personalised support. For more information about the community and a special offer for podcast listeners, go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. 
You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 53. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.